I seeing my my web browser? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, inputs, and basically, I'm going to talk about sensors more than more than uh, inputs. Is um, obviously sensors are inputs, and we're going to start talking about uh, let's say the high level discussion around sensors and then we're going to go to practical stuff and how to use it and how some tricks on, on how to use and read information from the outside at the end uh, we we need to remember always that we are just working with with bits with information okay so we have several techniques to to read information from around us but always keep in mind that we just try to understand what's happening around in, in uh, gathering information. So in the document we have, the first point, the first idea is why do we need sensors? Why do we need sensors? Because there's a lot of things that happen around us that we don't see, that or biological sensors or senses doesn't, um, doesn't see. Right, so what's the temperature of the air? Well, I can say if it's too hot or too cold, but I cannot say it's 23.6 degrees. How much oxygen there's here? I don't know, no clue about it. If I start, if I start uh, feeling uh, short of breath, maybe I can get a clue, but that's my only way of knowing that. No? So we use some devices to gather that information and convert it to some other type of information that we can measure, right? Uh, what's the simplest thing we can measure normally? Electrical signals, voltages, okay? So most of the sensors are a way to convert some other information, to transform that information into a voltage, okay? Why do we need them? Because we don't see most of the things that happens around us and we want to see them so we translate that information in an information that we can see or read okay we are using physical reactions mostly sometimes chemical or even bio reactions depending on the type of sensors we use because based on this uh, concept we can think uh, as any lichen on a tree as a sensor because it changes color depending on the amount of light it is receiving it changes color depending on the pollution around it so if we have a, a, a light sensor that measures that lichen we can uh, on reality extrapolate the, the pollution levels right so we do exactly that principle with different kinds of reactions. There are electrochemical uh, sensors to measure gases on the atmosphere that simply do a reaction uh, and oxidize some metal or, or uh, whatever kind of chemical reaction that we can measure. Normally we measure those reactions with electricity, making a, a flow of electrons through a, a, a something and measuring the resistance or measuring how much current it can uh, output or measuring stuff like that. Things that we can read very simple with a microcontroller in our case. This lead us, I'm gonna just jump this for now, sensing the environment, I, uh, more or less is what I'm saying, but uh, uh, we're gonna talk about this later a little bit more. What is a closed loop system? I hope you all have an idea around this, no? If, uh, because you already talk about machines, you already work with CNC's, with 3D printers, etc. So normally we use inputs to gather information and outputs to express something, to do some action on the environment. And a closed loop system is a system that includes both of the actions, the action of hearing something and based on the information we receive, we act in some way, right? So for example, a CNC, a normal CNC has encoders. An encoder, later we're gonna talk about them, is a, is a way to realize the position in each axis of the head of the CNC. 
based on how much turns the motor has done or based on how much uh, lines uh, lead has crossed or we're going to see a lot of techniques to find out this, these things. But the CNC is always in a closed loop system reading the position and then um, acting on, on after that. That means uh, he knows where he is and he knows how, more, how much he has to move to arrive to the point he wants to go. Please, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make a pause please, now. Uh, please interrupt me. I am feeling a, a little bit dumb talking here to a computer without seeing all of you. And I don't know if everyone is following, following me or not. So please feel free to talk at any point. Uh, I'm not used to do classes like this, and I don't like to do classes like this, so try to help me uh, with a little bit of interaction, if you can, of course. <laughs> For me, everything okay. is okay. Yeah? It's quite simple enough. Yeah. Okay. So closed-loop systems. Everyone knows them, and it's, uh, it's an important concept, no? Now, when we read, we normally just think uh, a sensor like a, a little black box that gives us some specific information. I have a temperature sensor. It's this black guy with three small metal legs that, has, that is connected to my device and tells me the temperature. What happens inside, I don't know and I don't care. It's just a temperature sensor. And this is a whole sensor that measures if a magnet is closed. How it works, I don't know and I don't care. And it only tells me when a magnet is, is close enough. But the thing is, all of those little black boxes can be used to infer some other information. For example, if I know that the temperature is high, maybe I can realize that the oven is on, right? And that's not a direct information that the, that little black box is giving to me. It's just a secondary metric that I am inferring from the first one. So we have, let's say, a set of really simple sensors that will give us, um, sorry, that will give us, um, let's say, first line information. And we will try to do with that second or third or even fourth or more line information. That means uh, more complex information, information based on simple information gathered from simple physical reactions or chemical reactions, okay? <clears throat> Here is, there's a couple of examples. For example, uh, uh, speedometer. I don't know if that's the right word, but these devices that measure speeds on bikes are based just on detecting a magnet. So how can you measure the speed of a bike just by detecting a magnet? That's a beautiful problem, no? Everyone that, uh, today's uh, young people will think immediately i have my phone i have a gps i can know my speed so he's going to use a satellite signal to measure the speed of a bike but the 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 trustable device is only a magnet that is detected every time the wheel turns so if you count how many times the magnet passes per minute and you know the circumference of the wheel you can calculate the speed on real time, right? And that's a lot simpler, a lot cheaper, and normally more precise than a GPS, unless you have the best uh, relative GPS on the world, right? But it's a little bit stupid to use some devices flying around Earth to know the speed of my bike, if I can do it with a magnet, right? I put a, um, a small uh, yeah. GIF in the chat if you want to, uh, to open it, Victor to simplify this. Sorry? I put a, you a, small, a small image in the chat if you want to simplify. Ah, in the chat. OK. I'm pretty slow because uh, I have to use Chromium for this fucking Zoom thing. and. Okay, you see it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. And how do I close the chat? Yeah. Okay. 
So this is a two magnet. I was talking about a one magnet. It's even simpler. <laughs> but yeah, this is the idea, no? So how do you know if uh, the elevator door is going to crash your hand or crash a kid? You just put a light and a light sensor on both sides of the door and you see if someone is interrupting that light, right? And at the end, you just use a light sensor to avoid crashing someone with the door, right? You want to know how many water you have in your tank. Uh, in a lot of places in the world, people doesn't have flow, uh, the same uh, availability of water like we have here. So you need to know how much water you have in the exterior tank to know how much time you can shower, right? So how do you measure that? You will think, well, I, I can measure the pressure of the water. So if the column of water is bigger, then there's more pressure. And I can calculate the amount of water. I can measure how much water enters my tank and how much water gets out of my tank with a fan or a una hélice. I don't know the word in English, um, to uh, encamp how many rotations it does when the water passes. Or I can put uh, mm -hmm. a level, a floating level, right? And measure the angle of the bar that touches the floating uh, stuff. Or I can put an ultrasonic sensor on top of the water and measure how far the water level is from the top of the tank, right? So there's a lot of different techniques to get the number we are looking for. And I think this concept is very important for you and more in, in COVID times because you're going to have limited amount of sensors at home or you're going to build uh, really uh, simple sensors. And this idea of inferring complex metrics from simple sensors is very powerful in you, if you get, get it right. Okay, the next um, concept is composed sensors. I think we more or less cover it because it's a kind of a, uh, inferring metrics, but with a specific technique of having more than one type of sensors. No, the elevator example I did is, is one of those. You have an emitter of light and a receiver of light. So you can measure if something is in the middle. But for example, let's uh, think of a problem. Imagine that someone passes with a lamp, a LED lamp, that emits exactly the same type of light that your sensor is programmed to receive. So it will fool your sensor, right? That happens a lot with the LIDAR sensors, sensors that depend on light when the sun is up. Uh, they get confused because you're receiving a lot of light in the same frequencies that you are uh, trying to, you're searching for. So what can you do? If you have an emitter and a receiver, then you can decide to make pulses in a specific pattern, in a specific frequency. And then you are not searching just for light, but for this tan, 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 light, right? And then if you detect that, then you can close the door. Even if people have a LED lantern, they won't fool you, right? So this idea that you control the emitter and the receiver in a composed sensor is also very powerful because you can scale it to a next level, okay? Now, other idea. You get data for a ver from a very simple sensor, but you can get a lot of data and you can post-process that data and do complex operations on it to get extra information that you cannot see just by measuring something. I'm going to put an example. I have a, an LDR, imagine. And I put it in a motor that scans something and I get a picture that's a line of pixels, right? Pixel one is white, pixel two is uh, gray, black, etc. So I get, I get a black and white picture, the, the same that I get if I take a picture with a camera. But if I treat those just as numbers, they are just numbers, a number in the level of light in each point, and I search for a pattern in that line of numbers, that pattern can be someone's face or can be a pigeon in my balcony, 
or can be whatever I want. And I try to track that pattern in the next image. Imagine I take several images or continuously measuring images. If I just search for that pattern in all the images in, in a continued stream of numbers, let's say, I can realize if the pigeon is moving, if the pigeon is on the balcony, if the pigeon is more on the left or on the right, because depending on the position of those numbers, I know where my servo motor was pointing. Okay, so doing more complex processing on top of a simple data that can be just a, a value between zero and 1024, and that's a level of light with measure with an LDR and my Arduino, I can realize if a pigeon is in my balcony. Okay, obviously this is not a simple task. What I'm trying to say is this concept of doing complex processing on top of simple information can lead us to very complex sensors that could be even impossible to build as just one level sensor. A sensor that, a pigeon sensor, that doesn't exist and no one has invented it yet. But you can use something a lot simpler to detect pigeons, okay? This idea leads us to, uh, obviously, all the, the, the advancements around uh, computer vision, machine learning, and stuff like that, that everyone is talking about them like they were magic. Those aren't magic, are just ways of doing complex processing on top of simple data. One of the secrets in, in all of this uh, stuff is you need a lot of data, a lot of data. If you, need, if you have more data, then you have more precise uh, approximations on it. I always, when I talk about sensors, I always like to put uh, this video. I'm going to show you this video that, um, and after it, we're going to talk about this concept of sensor fusion. I'm sure Oscar will detect a lot of errors in my class because he is the real expert on these matters. But uh, let's hope he doesn't say them in front of me and it says to you tomorrow when I'm not here. So I don't feel so dumb. Uh, but let's see this video. Uh, I don't know if sound passes through. Do you get the sound of the video? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we okay. Do. Yes. The promise of smartphones, offices, classrooms, and indeed the entire Internet of Things relies on robust sensing of the environment. There are two ways to achieve this today. One option is to upgrade one's home with smart appliances. However, these are expensive and rarely talk to one another. The more flexible option is for owners to use an object with an aftermarket sensor. Some level of smartness. He explored an alternate and general purpose sensing approach where a single highly capable sensor board can indirectly monitor an entire room. We started our research by building an inventory of sensors used in commercial and academic systems. We decided to include all of these sensor dimensions, but no camera, as this sensor is particularly sensitive to users. Our sensor board is plug and play, uses wall power, and connects to our cloud backend over Wi Fi. A single sensor board in the room can capture a wide variety of events. Just a, a note here on the side, a side note. Um, there's a lot of metrics here. You can see they're measuring a lot of things. All of those are simple numbers. Uh, I mean, uh, there are simple sensors that doesn't uh, measure something too complex, but they are linked between them by the time they were taken. So you can link and cross all this data as one single number, let's say, because of the timing of each reading. So at this point, I have this value in X, this value in Y, this value in Z, this value in humidity, et cetera, et cetera. That's what enables you to do what they are going to do here. Sensor signals. 
as it turns on, they still burn the fuel. The fuel truck will burn too much fuel. Not only that the burner is on, but one burner can be all hot and it's just low level sense of data is very low interest to users. Instead, we use machine learning to automatically recognize patterns of sensor activation and expose these high level environmental events as synthetic sensors. Although virtual, they can be treated just like traditional physical sensor feeds, triggering user defined functions or used by developers to build responsive applications. Importantly, raw sensor data is never sent to the cloud. Instead, it's featurized in our sensor board and shouts to anonymize signals before transmission. Our system works across many different settings. For example, the shower in the bathroom, the two vanity closets, areas of bathroom accessories, the full flushing, and the state of lighting. We can also detect multiple events in the house, including when a fireplace is on, when the water tank is heating, when the dryer is running, and when the HVAC is on. In a workshop or industrial setting, we can detect multiple events such as when the dust turbine is running or if the exit switch fan is on. Different tools such as saws, a shop vac, a wood press, a grinder, and various handheld tools. In a workplace or an office, we can detect a suite of events such as if a phone is ringing, can detect reading on a whiteboard and also erase it. A water fountain running, urinals flushing, and paper towels dispensing. The synthetic sensors seen thus far we call first order synthetic sensors. However, these first synthetic sensors can be fed into second order synthetic sensors, able to capture higher level semantics, such as count, duration, and state. For example, a first-order towel dispense sensor can power a second-order sensor that tracks the number of towels used. With such a sensor, a facilities manager can automatically receive alerts for scheduled use time requests. In this example, a first-order closet running sensor is used to power a second-order water consumption sensor. Metrics like this can inform monitoring, behavior change, and other applications. Finally, more complex devices can have multiple states beyond just on or off, like this microwave. Here you can see first order synthetic sensors responsible for recognizing individual states. By building on top of these sensors, it is possible to create a second order sensor that tracks the state of the device. Part of this high level understanding, richer assistive applications can be built. Finally, there's no reason to stop at second order synthetic sensors. These can feed into higher order sensors, able to capture more complex environmental facets like human activity and the mechanical Please see our paper for more details. Thanks for watching our video. So, any thoughts around this? Getting spied on is, is scary. <laughs> Too much. So, as I understood, that it's kind of a synchronized detection between uh, like a couple of simple uh, sensors that they tout the machines to understand that uh, what events happening around. Yeah, and this idea is uh, based on this concept of uh, fusioning or mixing different types of metrics from coming from different types of sensors and based on the mix uh, of those data inferring something more uh, more complex let's say or something that cannot measure directly for i'm gonna 
make a, another example. Imagine that we, with the Smart Citizen Kit that we do at the Fab Lab, we are trying to measure the amounts of, of pollution in, in the corner of a, of a street. And we, are, we measure the amount of particles that are there, but we are also measuring the levels of noise because we also have a microphone, right? So we can see the levels of noise uh, and identify when a bus is. And we obviously see the pollution levels raising when the bus passes. And then they go down and the noise go down and you can uh, identify a relation between those two. So the, at some point you can even uh, ignore one of the two and infer the other one with the first one, if you already know the, the relation between those two, right? This is a real, sim really simple example that doesn't explain the full concept of sensor fusion, because that means uh, mixing a lot more signals in a more complex way. The idea that you can get a third grade of information based on two informations that by themselves doesn't tell you anything about it is very powerful. Um, maybe my example is not the best because you are not getting some extra information about the bus or the pollution based on noise and, and, and pollution. That example uh, just uh, explains this idea of finding relations between two streams of data. But what they show in the video is uh, if they cross, for example, the accelerometer with the thermal image, they can distinguish if the movement comes from lighting one part of the stove or the other or opening the microwave, no? So, for example, imagine that the microwave generates the same vibrations that the door of the fridge. If you also have a microphone that uh, detects a beep that's not being detected by the accelerometer, then you can distinguish between those two. And if you also have a thermal imaginary, imaginary on top, then you can distinguish also from the stove, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea of a lot of metrics, very cheap and simple metrics, cross will give you a high level sensor that can even detect any kind of human activity. Well, that's it, their idea right here. Yeah? Um, Victor, so, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you explain uh, the first order and second order, uh, the difference between the two? I don't care. Can you repeat your question? I, I receive it. Uh, could, you, could you explain the difference between the first order sensors and the second order sensors in the video? I didn't get that. In the part. video. Let's, let me find that part and we can discuss. Towards the end, when they're counting the, uh, paper, the paper uh, tissues, When they talk here about this, yeah. the role sensor streams, right? That's yeah. pure data, just acceleration in X that detects vibrations in some axis, right? Then they also have sound, for example, and they mix those two and they can have what they call the first order synthetic sensors. That means they can realize the oven is opening. The microwave oven is opening because it has a signature in terms of vibration and in terms of sound, right? So they realize the, the, the microwave is open and that's the first order of what they call synthetic sensors. Let's say they are mixing two or three or several streams of raw data to realize one action. And then they go, let me see where they do that. Here. In fact, they use the, the microwave as, as an example. Let's just see again this. Uh, can you have multiple states beyond just the on or off? Tricks like this can inform monitoring, behavior change, and other applications. Finally, more complex devices can have multiple states beyond just the on or off, like this microwave. Here you can see first order synthetic sensors responsible for recognizing individual states. By building on top of these sensors, it is possible to create a second order sensor that tracks the state of a device. Armed with this high level understanding, 
a second order sensor that tracks the state of the device, right? That means that the first level sensor will identify action on the door of the microwave. And they build a conceptual uh, second level sensor that tracks those movements and realize, realizes the state of the microwave. Okay? So is that clear? Yeah. No, I don't see you too too sure about it being clear. <laughs> no, what I'm no, saying no, I get is, it, I get it. Yeah, okay. So, raw data, mixed data will give you a first level of data, and then you can go as high as you want, inferring some other stuff. Obviously, if you have uh, an active state on the microwave in less than some amount of seconds, you can infer that there are some humans on the kitchen. And that's a next level sensor, let's say, that you can call a present sensor because there is no microwave, there's no need for coffee if there's no humans. No? That's, that's more or less uh, the, the concept. Okay? Yeah, On the bottom of the documentation, there is a really big list, a link to a really big list. It's not uh, updated and it's not, uh, let's say, Pretty, it's always a, 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 a work in progress, but there is a list of sensors that you can review later. And I'm not going to go through them, obviously, in this class. And there are also some actuators. But at the bottom, there is a, a list of um, complex sensors, let's say, or, or funny videos that uh, scratches the surface around these concepts, okay, of more complex sensors. Sensors. So later, if you're bored, I'm sure you will be because of the COVID, you can check that list of videos. In fact, uh, there is a couple of lists of videos about uh, laboratories that are doing development around complex sensors that are very interesting to watch. Okay, until here, anyone has any question? More or less, we have reviewed the idea of uh, the, the, what we call here the core ideas of, of sensing. I'm sure I'm, I am missing a lot of stuff. I, I apologize, but this stuff of doing classes in front of a computer doesn't fit me pretty well. So, If anyone has any question until here, please fire up. If not, I'm going to go to more practical stuff. No one has questions or no one is hearing? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Continue. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, trying to install in my Linux the Zoom application so I can see the faces of all of you, but I'm not sure how that will go. I'm sure for the next class I will have it ready. It's, so, it's worth it because, uh, for example, I don't usually use the sound. I prefer to mimic things with my hands, so it's easier to to see me. No, of uh, course, of course. If I see your faces, I can do a lot better classes. That's what. That's why I am doing it. I didn't know that I need the app to do that. So maybe later I can do a break and finish the install, the installation, and, and migrate myself to the application. In fact, in theory, it is there. I'm going to try to open it, and if it works, I'm going to switch. Joining meeting, I think I'm there. Um.
I'm here. Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry about, about that, but now I see you all on the top. Okay, that's cool. Proprietary software working. Yeah, okay. you should like believe in the effort of a lot of companies paying for, you know, developing things. That's Okay. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> now we're going to see how can I kill a mouse with a sensor. If you follow my document, I'm sharing the screen. No. I want mm. to share this desktop. Do you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about digital signals, okay? The simplest sensor around is um, uh, okay, sorry. The simplest sensor around is a sensor that give us a yes or no answer, right? Uh, true or false, uh, high or low, uh, ground or voltage, or zero or five, whatever uh, way you call this dichotomy of, uh, of uh, values, right? So that's, I hope you, everyone, use those concepts as a digital sensor, right? A sensor that give us information based on ones and zeros, right? So let's start uh, talking about uh, ways of uh, realizing true or false information of our environment. This guy built a simple array of uh, mouse traps, and he connect a cable to one side of the trap and another cable to the other one. So if he pushes voltage through this cable and he connects this to a pin of his Arduino or microcontroller, he can read if the trap is open or not, right? It has a little flaw because if the mouse is too big, even if the trap is closed, there's not going to be any contact because there's going to be a mouse in the middle. <laughs> but that's just a mechanical issue, not a, a sensor issue. But this, this idea is the same that we use when we push a simple push button, push button, right? We just connect to cables. So if those cables are touching themselves, are touching, uh, the, the electrons will flow through the cable and we can measure that, right? That will give us a digital signal. There is some quirks around this. so. Uh, we need to learn a little bit about what we call, for example, pull-ups and pull-downs. Later, if you like, you can review the document. I think it's more or less uh, explained. I'm going to do a brief explanation on pull-ups and pull-downs. So um, you can use them, okay? If, uh, as, if you read this, you will follow me. The, um, when you want to read a signal with your microcontroller, the pin you're going to use has to be put, has to be changed to input mode. I'm sure you all have done that in an Arduino. In the top, in the setup function, you just write pin mode input, right? What's, what does this instruction does inside the microcontroller? It changes the pin to what it's called a high impedance state. That means there's a lot of resistance in that pin and it will stop the flow of, uh, of current and keep it to the minimal. And it will try, the Arduino will try to check if there is a voltage or not on that pin, right? But the thing is when the mouse trap is open and the Arduino goes to, to one line of the, the Arduino pin is connected to this line. 
this line is not touching anything. So since the pin is not receiving a clear signal and the state of uh, input is with high impedance, impedance, then the signal will jump between high and low. That means that there's going to be a lot of noise and you're going to receive a lot of false mouse trapped between a couple of seconds because the, the signal will jump between low and high, low and high, low and high randomly, right? So you don't want that. You want to have a low signal or a high signal, depending on your design, always, unless the trap is closed, right? That's why we use pull up. That means pulling the signal up to one, to five volts, to two, or pull downs pull that signal down, okay? How do we do that? We just use a resistor that has a really high value to pull the signal. For example, in this schematic, it's pulling the signal of this uh, side to five volts. So in my uh, microcontroller, I'm gonna be always receiving a one, unless, this is directly connected to ground because since there is no resistance here, if I connect this to ground, then I will receive a zero because the resistance is very high, okay? So the idea of these resistors is to make the signal stable when we are not receiving anything in that pin. And when we receive what we're looking for, that signal is going to have more strength than the one that the, that the pull up or pull down is doing. This is, uh, is sending to us, is being sent by to us. Okay. So I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so why we are not using, for example, the two parallel capacitor to do this because why? in electronic, the two capacitors, uh, capacitor, like uh, as a filter of the voltage, so we can kind of smoothing, smoothing the curve of the voltage. But why do we're you reading to the signal? Was it, okay, maybe I, I didn't explain well the the problem of the of the high impedance state. If there's nothing connected to it, we're going to receive noise, but that noise is not not going to be around zero, neither around one. It's going to be jumping between zero and one. And if we filter that signal, we're going to have an average of exactly the middle point, right? And that's yes. nothing to us because we want a zero or we want a one. We don't want a, a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay? I understand. No, 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 my mistake. Yeah. No, 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 it's not, it's not a mistake. It's a valid question. But the idea is there's no, the, the thing is there's no information there. Even if we uh, discard the noise, the information there is not valid. So we want a, a, a value that has a big difference. It is or it isn't, right? So the pull down will keep that value low unless we uh, feed voltage to it. If we filter the three signals, the zero, the middle point, and the one, we will receive a clean signal, but still that doesn't solve the, the problem, okay? Yeah, understood. Okay. Uh, so, in this last paragraph, I explain a little bit about input pull-ups. I'm just going to mention briefly. Inside a lot of microcontrollers, I always use here the example of the Arduino Uno because it's the most common. And I know that you're using ESP and some SAMD51, I think, or not. I don't remember which one of the models you're using. So you have to check the data sheet of your chip to uh, see the specific uh, implementation on it. But most of microcontrollers have what is called internal pull-ups. That means that inside the electronics, there is a resistor that pulls the signal of the pin to a high level if you enable that resistor, okay? So in the Arduino libraries, in the Arduino code, there is a uh, uh, constant that you execute with the, the pin mode instruction that I told you before. Here's a link to the Arduino reference so you can later 
research on it. Is there, say, is, see, yeah? is there some input perhaps on the ESP32 as well? Uh, as far as I remember, there should be. You, why don't you do us a favor to research that while I finish explaining the input pull-ups? I'm yes. sure there's Google can answer you in more in a couple of seconds. I thought you were Google. Sorry? Nothing. Okay. So in, in any case, up. it will be that that go, not Google. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Since we are using Zoom, I don't know if we are on the dark side of the force or on the... <laughs> <laughs> So far we are training. Okay, so the pin mode can be input, output, or a third one that's called input pull up. Okay, this will be an input and it will enable a pull up resistor that's inside the chip. That means that the input will always report true or high level unless we connect ground to it and we don't need to put any external resistor, okay? If for any reason we want a pull down because our signal is high, the signal we want to detect, then we need to put it as an external resistor and we need to just use pin mode input, okay? Normally for this kind of pull ups or pull downs, we try to use a high, uh, high value on the resistor. 10K is one of the most common. Why do we want a high value? Because we don't want to, to waste energy on that, right? So a high resistance there will uh, stop most of the current from flowing permanently. I have another question. Yeah. Why we are not using the ground? Why are, can you uh, make- Why we are not clear? using the ground because the, the ground is the highest uh, resistor that we can have. The ground is the highest resistor we can have. I'm not sure so, what are you trying to say with that. We can, the ground is, is one side of our, our voltage, right? Is where we have zero volts. Yes. Remember voltage is a differential measure between two points, right? Yes. So in one side we have zero volts and the other one we have five volts. And the resistance is in the circuit. How much current can pass through the circuit? So I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm following you when you're saying the ground is the highest resistance that we can use. I think uh, what uh, Arman means is that sometimes there's the similarity between ground and, and, and earth somehow uh, and that we assume that like earth as planet earth is a very, a very big resistor somehow but I, I'm not sure probably I'm getting it that wrong. Ground you mean yes. connecting to, to the soil to the to the real ground to, to the earth? No the board the board ground the shield. ground of the board, yeah. No, the no. ground of the board. The ground, the GND. The yes, pin yes. that says GND. Yes. Uh, well, because uh, maybe I have to explain a little bit more about this, but uh, ground, uh, again, voltage. Do you know what voltage is? Can you yes. elaborate a little bit around that? Voltage, as you understand, if correct me if I am saying something that you don't agree, is a differential measure between two points, the differential of potential, right? Put it in simple terms that I always do that in my classes is a bucket that's filled with water and a bucket that's empty. The empty bucket is ground and the filled water, the filled bucket is five volts in this case, right? Yes. So the water wants to go between one bucket and the other because the difference, the difference of levels. That's a circuit, no? That with yes. a, a power source. And the resistance is the size of the tube we are using. If we use a small tube, then the water will flow slowly because it cannot pass 
easily through the tube. If we use a really big tube, the water will flow immediately and the, the two buckets will level each other, right? Yes. So the resistance is just how easy we make to the water flowing from one point to the other. So what I, what I was saying that we are using here a high resistance is we are doing a connection here to the field bucket, right? Five volts. So some water will flow here and we want that water to be as small as possible. That's why we put high resistance here. So the, only a drop of water is flowing. If we put there a low resistance, then a lot of water will flow. And your question is, why don't we use ground? Because it is the um, higher resistance, right? Yes, but I guess I understood what you're saying. So what I like, I mis like misunderstood here is that the earth as a ground and the ground of the board. So I guess it's just a conceptual mistake by okay. me. But yeah, I understood. So it's kind of like controlling the flow of the electricity through that point. Exactly. So, okay, okay. The, the resistor will allow us to read the level of the field bucket because we are in fact connected to the field bucket, right? So we yes. are receiving that level of pressure. So in our microcontroller, we're gonna read five volts, but we don't need too much water to read that signal, right? True. Because we yes. just want to read it. That signal is not gonna execute any work. It's not gonna light a LED, it's not gonna move a fan or anything. It's just gonna tell us some data. Okay, you have a one, you have a true, you have a high level. So that's why we want to minimize the flow of water, but still we want to be connected to the five volts. Okay? So yeah. continuing with this analogy, imagine that I connect the other side of this circuit to ground. That means the empty bucket, then the water will flow to that side and we are not gonna receive any water, right? Yeah. So we're gonna see a zero, a low level. Yeah, always zero, yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I hope I, I, I make it clear. I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't follow really well your question, but I, I hope it's clear. No, I understood, I understood completely. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So can uh, the duk duk go guy answer us? Does the ESP has internal pull-ups? I use Ecosia, not DocDocGo. Sorry? I use Ecosia, not DocDocGo. But yes, in the chat, I put the, the link and it's exactly the same as Arduino. You use the same code as if it was okay. an Arduino. Yeah, the code normally, well, always is the same if you are using Arduino. The only thing that you need to check that you already checked is that the microcontroller is capable of doing it. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Ecosia guy. My pleasure. So, pull-ups and pull-downs, I hope that recipe is clear. And normally you always use them if you want to measure a button, if you want to measure a mousetrap, if you want to measure anything that will just connect your pin to high or to low. And that will give you the simplest sensor available on town, a sensor that will give you zeros or ones true or false, okay? Now, inside that simple information, sometimes there is more. And the thing is we can measure time between pulses and we can count the amount of pulses that something is generating, right? So, there is uh, here, a link to the reference of pulls in. That's an, uh, a handy function that Arduino made for us to measure the amount of time a pin takes to change his state from low to high, for example. So this is really useful when you are trying to get, some, get more information from these changes, okay? If you just want to know 
if the mouse is trapped or not, then this doesn't make sense. But sometimes you want to know the speed of the wind. So you have a regulete, I don't know the word in English, those stuff that turns when the air hits them. A windmill? An anemometer. Yeah, but the, the, the Chino version, the, the <laughs> windmill. The, this color uh, thing that I'm seeing all, all over the, my, the buildings of my neighbors from the window. Ah. You know, uh, reguilete, I, I call them in Mexico, but, but well, these toys, let's say. If you put a magnet on those toys and uh, a sensor that detects a magnet, you're going to receive a pulse every now and then, depending on the speed of the wind, right? And if you count those pulses and use the time information, the time between each pulse, you can calculate the speed of the wind, right? I think it's called pinwheel in English. Okay, thank you very much. Pin roll? Wheel. Pin wheel, okay. Well, you can use a pin wheel or ask your neighbor for someone, for some, because I'm sure your, your neighbor will have one. I'm seeing like three around my neighborhood from here. So one of those will give you an anemometer DIY, right? Just by counting pulses and by reading changes between high and low. Obviously, you will need a pull down or a pull up when the magnet is not close enough to your switch. There is something that's called a read switch. Here you can find it in the list, I think. This is just, uh, yeah, this read switch. As you can see, this is one of the simplest sensors you can find. It's just a glass capsule with two wires that are a little bit uh, separated. And when a magnet is close, they touch each other. Okay, like blink. So you can read a pulse. You don't even need a whole sensor or anything complex. Just put one of these and one magnet stick to your wheel and you will have an anemometer if you count pulses. Okay. Now, when you use normal buttons or magnets on wheels or whatever kind of um, device that changes from high to low or low to high, Normally you have some uh, defects that are because of the reality not being perfect never. So if you see this image, this is the kind of signal that, that you will receive from a push button if you read it on an oscilloscope, right? It is high, your pull up is pulling your signal high and when someone presses the button, it starts jumping between high and low for a really small amount of time. Normally this time is a couple of, mi of milliseconds and then it is fu fully pushed and then you get ground, you get zero volts. And when it is released in the change between one state and the other, you always have some noise, okay? And since your microcontroller normally is a lot faster to read than that noise, Oops, sorry. Then you need to clear that, uh, you need to clean that noise. And there's a, a trick called the bouncing button. And in the document, there is even a link to uh, an official uh, page of Arduino for the bouncing buttons. And here is a, a simple circuit. and you can check here the code. What it does is that it makes a small pause in the readings exactly after the first change. And then if the change is stable for an amount of time defined by you, then you assume the button change state, okay? So you try to clear and clean this area of the plot. So you just receive a high and then a low and you can read a perfect change in state, okay? I'm not gonna go deep into, uh, deeper into this because I'm eating too much time. 
but you can read here in the documentation or on the Arduino reference how does it work, okay? Now, if someone has any question around reading digital signals, please tell them now. Remember just there is an instruction in Arduino, a function called um, digital read. It will only return high or low, true or false, one or zero. And what it does is it reads the value of a voltage in a specific pin. And if the value is close enough to high level, it will say one. And if it is close enough to low level, it will say zero. Is the way of deciding if it's high or low is not dividing into two and checking where it is. Normally there is a gray area in the middle. You can check that in the data sheet of the microcontroller and an area of high and an area of low. Okay, you have three areas. And if it is in the middle, you, have, you don't have a clear answer. That means that the answer will be uh, indeterminate. On, on, I don't know. Okay? Undetermined. Exactly. Undetermined. Thank you. So each one of us pronounce it a little bit different. And I say indeterminada. So. <laughs> Perfect. Keep okay. it going. Okay. So any questions around uh, digital signals? It's pretty simple. But I'm sure you can have questions around it. No? Pull ups, pull downs. The bouncing, nothing special there, right? Okay. So remember time, because there's at the end a lot of information. In fact, most of the information we receive from any kind of device comes like a digital signal, ones or zeros, but based on protocols. So we encode data in ones and zeros a long time with a protocol, with some rules on how to encode information. So when we talk to a digital sensor, when we talk uh, through Wi-Fi, when we talk through networks, you're gonna see that and I think in another week uh, assignment, when you see networking, you're gonna read in fact, high and low levels. And you can fake those signals, you can fake a, a protocol but do it by doing what is called bit banging, right? Just making your microcontroller fire up pulses in a specific pattern with a specific timing. And if you receive that on the other side, you can use that to read some uh, information on, of any kind, okay? So it's not just buttons, it's from here to, to the most complex network you can find. Now, at the end is the same. Now, analog values is a totally different beast. Okay, can someone tell me the difference? I'm, I'm sure you know it. Well, analog values can go from, like depends on the bit uh, conversion, can go from like any amount of numbers, like zero to 500 to 1000 to 4000 and more. Okay. So you're saying we can have variable numbers, right? The yeah, resolution... it's a range of numbers instead of uh, like a boolean. Sorry? That is a range of number instead of a boolean. Exactly. We can have a full range of numbers. That means that we can measure a full range of voltage, not just the lowest level and the highest level. We don't define those three areas that I was talking before. We just check the level of the voltage and depending on the resolution of uh, our device, we can see exactly where it is, right? It, it is as a, as a floating point number, let's say. We can see if it is in 3.25 voltage, volts, right? And that will give us another type of information than the digital one. It won't give us a, a true or false, a Boolean response, but it will give us a level, a level of something, a signal that we can process and understand later. So the first uh, thing is how do we measure that? 
Then I'm going to go a little bit on what kind of signals we receive. How do we measure that? There is a device inside uh, most of the microcontrollers called an ADC. ADC means uh, analog to digital converter. Uh, I don't know if you already know a little bit about this or you want me to go to it. No, I think we haven't go deep in that. So please okay. go. I'm not going to go very deep into it, but I'm just going to explain a little bit how it works. Okay, it's um, let's say a small part of the microcontroller that is in charge of converting a voltage receiving in a pin to a number. Okay, that voltage, depending on the microcontroller, can be in a range from ground to certain level. In an Arduino Uno, as always, that I use that example is from zero to five volts. And the number that's gonna output this device is also in a range from zero to certain number. And that number varies depending on the resolution of the device, okay? But it is always the same range. It's translated linearly from the voltage range to the number range. That means if we receive a zero, in the number, that means zero volts. And if we receive the highest value on the number, then we are talking about five volts in the voltage scale. In, if we receive the middle number, we are talking about 2.5 volts, etc. Okay? So then the amount of numbers that we can read here only defines the resolution. How precise is the, the measure of the voltage? Okay? Normally, in an Arduino Uno, we have an ADC that gives us a range between 0 and 1024. That means a 10-bit resolution ADC. That means 1024 is 5 volts, 512 is 2.5 volts, etc., etc. Okay? I'm going to go through that a little bit later. So, an ADC. What does an ADC do? It checks a signal that normally is changing over time because having a perfect stable signal is almost impossible in real world. So it has several stages to do that. I'm just going to mention them. Don't expect this to be a full explanation on how it, the inner parts of an ADC works, but just the steps. There's a first step called sampling and holding, okay? The microcontroller has kind of a buffer, kind of a... a a part of it that reads the state and copies the state of that signal. So if you receive 2.65 volts, it will copy that value and disconnect that value from the external one. So it is stable from, for a really small amount of time, but enough to measure it, okay? Because you cannot measure a signal that's changing all the time because the, the output is neither stable. So what you do is you sample that signal. You get a sample, get, check it exactly at this point, convert it to a number, and then do another sample. So you do samples depending on, on the refresh, uh, the sample rate, sorry, uh, very often or more spread on time on the signal, and then you reconstruct the signal, right? So the first stage will get a sample from the signal and isolate it from the signal. So that sample is stable. It's a voltage, a stable voltage inside the chip. Then it does what they call the quantitizing and encoding uh, um, stage. That's measuring that voltage. Normally, depending on the type of uh, ADC that's measured uh, with different techniques, you can measure it uh, like uh, charging a capacitor, for example, with that voltage and measuring the amount of time that the capacitor took, took to charge or something like that, depending on the device. You use different techniques based on time and charge and, and voltage to define how big is that voltage, okay? And then you encode that with a, couple, with a device called comparator, like a, an electronic device that can compare signals and you encode that to a number. You say, this is bigger than this. So that means it's one. 
but it's smaller than this, so that means it's 0 0.75, etc. Okay, so depending on the resolution of your ADC, you end up with a point that defines a number, right? That number can be very big or very small depending on that resolution. So the resolution of the ADC is measured in bits, okay? An 8-bit resolution goes from 0 to 256, okay? So you have 256 steps, possibilities, okay? And if you want to measure a very big voltage or you want to measure very precisely, then you need more bits to have more steps, okay? There is also another technique called variable range where you can reposition what you're measuring. So you can only measure, you, you will only measure, for example, the range between zero and one volt. And even if you have a low resolution ADC, you have a lot of steps for that small range because you know your value is gonna be always close to one. And if your value moves to two, then you move your range and you measure only around two, right? So these techniques are tricks that allow you to have better uh, resolution, more precise readings, depending on the, the electronics you're using. Victor, yeah, I was gonna ask you that because uh, I remember that sometimes when you read sensors, it starts in 300 or it, it doesn't it never goes or some never go to zero. How did yeah. you call that, that, uh, that parameter or that uh, coding line? Okay, to get a, a, an analog read, you use the re analog read function, right? But there's a couple of functions, I'm not gonna go very deep into them, to define the limits of what you're reading, okay? There's the analog reference. So the Arduino chip, I'm always talking about the Arduino Uno, you have to check for a specific chip if you're using a different one, has internal different levels of reference, that means I think there's one that's 1.1 uh, 1 .1 volts. So if you're measuring a really small signal, you can say analog reference uh, and uh, the 1.1 1 .1, uh, signal. I don't remember the name of the constant, but in the, ref in the documentation, it is written down. So you restrict the measuring from 0 to 1.1, 1 .1, okay? There's also a pin on the Arduino that says A ref. That is a pin where you can connect a voltage and use that voltage as your top limit, okay? So if you want to measure between zero and 2.5, you just get a 2.5 signal and connect it to that pin. And then your ADC will work between zero and that level, okay? There are other techniques. Sorry. I will not cover them it, right now. No, to I was gonna ask the you. Range. Victor, you said one before, uh, when, when you were doing reference to this, you said one uh, voltage variable, I think it was. Variable range. Thank you, yeah, that one was. Variable range is a technique of moving the range that you're measuring closer to the signal you're searching for. Imagine that I want to measure um, a signal between zero and high voltage, 1000 volts, okay? And my ADC can only give me uh, 10 bits of information. And I want to measure a signal very precisely. I want to know uh, two digits of, uh, decimal digits of the voltage. I cannot do that because I have 1000 volts and only 1000 steps. So each step corresponds to one volt. If I want more precision, then I have to, uh, make my, my range smaller, right? So I can make my range smaller and only measure 100 volts. But then I will not cover the full voltage. So I can move my range of measuring. If I know that my signal is close enough to this value, I put my range here. And when the signal moves, I put my range here, okay? That's what variable range means. There's a lot of techniques of doing that. Uh, it's mostly a uh, work in software and also a little bit on hardware, but it's a technique when you need to get more resolution from one signal and you don't have 
uh, a crazy high resolution ADC. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Victor, you question? can. You you, yeah. you could also for that case you can also you like uh, add another component that would be like a higher bit uh, ADC, right? You can use a higher bit ADC, or you can use a dynamic voltage divider with a with a, an electronic control uh, variable resistor, for example. I will explain now what is a, a voltage divider. So maybe that answer is, be, is gonna be clear, more clear after that explanation. But yeah, there is a lot of techniques of adding different uh, resources, hardware resources, to be able to have a, a dynamic range, okay? So, so okay, analog read will give us a number that's directly proportional to the amount of voltage we are receiving in a pin. Why do we want that? For example, an LDR, light dependent resistor, is a device that changes his resistance depending on the amount of light he is receiving, right? So we connect it to a voltage and we measure the resistance of that device and then we know how much light there's in the room. Right? There's a lot of sensors that work on this principle of changing the resistance of a material based on an external uh, signal. So that's why we want to measure voltages in a continuous way. Because in that way we can measure the resistance of any of those sensors. A thermistor is one of the most common uh, temperature sensors. It's just a material that changes his ability to, to let the electrons flow depending on the temperature. Those temp uh, thermometers that we use to check uh, body temperature are just that, are a simple resistor that changes depending on the temperature. So we push electrons through it and depending on the amount of electrons that can pass, we know the temperature, right? So. How do we measure a resistance? Because we only know how to measure voltages, right? We have an ADC that converts a voltage to a number. So how can we measure a resistance with this thing called a voltage divider? Okay, there's a lot of information on the net. This in fact is just Wikipedia, copy pasted here. But as you can see in this schematic, you have a voltage here, ground here, and here you connect your microcontrollers where it says uh, voltage out. And you have two resistors. This is the most common technique to measure a resistance. That will convert the, val the, val the value of one of the resistors to a voltage. Okay, why does that happen? If you see the drawing on the top, R2 is a resistor that I put there. It's a static resistor, okay? I know the amount of electrons that will be able to pass through it. And the top one, the LDR, is not stable. It changes depending on the amount of light. So I don't know that value, right? That, that's the value that I want to find out. And I know the amount of voltage I'm pushing here because I connected to the five volt pins on, of my Arduino and I know the voltage here is zero. So my question is, depending on which voltage I am reading here with my ADC, will, I can answer the value of the resistance here, right? Because I will measure how many electrons will pass from here to here. Here is a couple of formulas that will allow me to calculate that. The last one, if you check it, has all the variables that we know, so it's just a matter of replacing them. R1 is, is no, it's, sorry, it's not the last one, it's this one. R1 is the, the value I'm searching for, so I just get the value of this resistor normally 
I try to put here a resistor that's close to the middle point of this one. So when this is in the middle point, both are the same and they divide the voltage in half. And I know the voltage that's going in. I know the voltage that's going out. This is five volts. This is the reading I'm getting in my pin. And I know again this resistor. So I can calculate the resistor here. That means that the relation between the voltage and the resistance of the light sensor is linear and is uh, proportional always, right? So my voltage is always related to the amount of light that my LDR is receiving, okay? Does it mean if you miscalculate the value of resistance too, you get a wrong reading on the pin? Like if the resistor two is way high or way too low, has a way too high or way too low resistance, does it affect? It does affect, not in a way that you're going to get a, a wrong reading, but in a way that your range of readings is going to be squeezed. Because what you're getting here is the relation between those two, R1 and R2. If you check the equation, they are always related, right? So meaning so, the code, you have to tell it what's the max value. Like tell, tell it like two volts is the max value and zero volts is the minimum. So scale it up or... No, the thing is, uh, as the name says, this is a voltage divider. So the voltage that's getting input here is divided into two, two parts, depending on the value of these two. So the relation between these two will define this output. So if these two are too different, then you are squeezing the, the measures you're getting to one really close to zero or really close to the top. That means that you're not getting the full range of readings you, you can get. For example, if this resistor is too high, imagine this is always 10 and this is always between zero and one, then the voltage you're getting here is always closer to five volts than to ground really close to five volts because this resistor is always 10 times smaller than this. Okay. So the, the highest value you're going to get is five volts and the lowest value you're going to get is four. You're never going to get any value between zero and four because this is too high. Right. And then you are missing a lot of resolution because you are not using those uh, four volts of resolution. So to get the best out of a voltage divider, you want to make this as close as this as possible. Obviously, this is not static, so you don't know exactly how to define this one, but you know the middle point of this, right? Or you more or less have a clue. So you try to find one that's close enough so your middle point allow you to cover the more possible range. When I was talking a, a minute ago about dynamic range, there's another possibility here of using dynamic range. Imagine that this resistor is not an static resistor, but an electronic controllable resistor or a potentiometer controlled by hand, right? So you can change the value of this R2. So when you get a really high value from this, then you crank this up so it's close enough to the other one and your resolution suddenly is a lot bigger, okay? And when the value of this is too low, you can crank this down digitally or manually until you reach a high resolution. So the resolution here is defined by the difference between these two. If the difference is too high, the resolution is inversely proportional, it's too low. And if the difference is small, the resolution is high. Do I explain myself? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Here's a really simple example of code on uh, how to get uh, the LDR value. Normally, this part of getting the resistor or the resistance of the LDR, you don't do it because 
what's the point? You can use a voltage number because at the end it's just a relative number. It's not an absolute metric, right? You are not getting luxes. You're getting a number that you know it goes higher when there's more light and slower when there's less light. If you really want to get uh, uh, a specific uh, unit, you need to research a little bit on how to translate those numbers to the resistance and then to a, a, a lux. And that involves calibration of a sensor. Maybe Oscar can give you more, more clues around this or we can talk it later, but I'm not gonna cover uh, calibration now. Uh, okay, questions until here? No? Okay, I think I use more time than I was supposed to, so I'm just gonna use five minutes to cover a little bit about this uh, last part. It's just a couple of uh, advices on how to, to face the use of sensors. Normally, when we are new of in, in doing this, we tend to complicate our life too much. So try to follow the simplest path always and more in this specific situation that you are not able to gather any device that you want and you are not in an electronic lab uh, on a daily basis. So how to choose a sensor? Well, obviously depending on what do you want to measure, but these advice are more from the point of view of the practical part of buying that sensor. Depending on the complexity of the sensor, Obviously, you're going to choose this, the sensor uh, doing a research on, on the internet. But then the first uh, approach, I'm, I'm thinking about your final projects, okay? Don't, don't think this about like this, uh, of, don't think about these advices as uh, good for simple exercises. This is when you're trying to design a more complex uh, system. So you say, I want to measure uh, the temperature of the air. Then you do a small research on which devices are available. Then you don't go directly to integrate that device into your electronics board, into your design. You go and get a breakout board. That means a board that has the, the device soldered on top and the outputs of that sensor are just pins. In a way that you can prototype with those pins and connect it to a microcontroller and test and check and test your code and realize if it really does what you expect it to do, right? Depending on the type of sensor, maybe you can build your own breakout board or you can use directly a breadboard. But there's a lot of sensors that are too small and difficult to solder by hand. So you can buy in Adafruit, in a Sparkphone, in a Tindy, in a lot of places, breakout boards for a specific sensors, okay? with small boards that you can connect directly. So first advice, always use off the shelf devices with breakout boards to, for the prototyping stage. If you are using a simple enough sensor, you can do that, but always prototype before and test your code and your sensor reading. How to wire a sensor? I give you today some tricks around pull-ups, pull-downs, uh, voltage dividers, some recipes, but since we always promote open source, copy, copy everyone. So go uh, for uh, open source designs and open the schematic. Go for the GitHub of a Sparkphone, of uh, Adafruit, of whichever design you find on the network and open the schematic and see how they did it. What resistors they put around the sensor. Do they have a capacitor to filter the signal? Do they, okay? So copy always those designs and you get an idea copying that design, you prototype it with a, with a breakout board and there's a lot more probability that you will end up with a working sensor after a couple of days than if you try to do it from scratch by yourself directly into your uh, final idea. Okay, so try to always divide and go step by step. 
And those two steps are very important. And lastly, but very important is coding, right? Coding for a sensor, I just give you the, the simplest thing, digital read, digital write, sorry, uh, analog read and digital read, but that's just the raw data, right? Normally we want to do something with that data. So that's not covered in this session, but you need to do a lot of processing with that data and uh, to get something valuable of it. And that's a really important part, but concentrate first in getting valid raw data, right? So try to divide this in different steps and get raw data and then start working with that raw data. Okay, if you have a clear path, a clear concept of what information you want to get at the end, just subdivide the steps in terms of hardware. Once the hardware is working and you get raw data, subdivide the steps on getting the complex data that you want from that raw data, okay? If you try to divide a lot these things, those tend to be a lot simpler. Later, I discussed yesterday with Oscar the idea of making it today, but normally we do a debugging class, how to debug your circuits, how to debug your code, because normally you lose more time trying to make it work than designing it, right? So some advices on how to debug efficiently are always welcome, at least from my point of view, because you always lose a lot of time. So assume that things are going to go wrong, things are going to be misconnected, and recheck everything, and divide the problem always in small parts, and analyze each part, test each part separately, and then do the complex work. Later, I think we're going to do uh, uh, more uh, an in-deep class of debugging techniques, but just for you, not losing too much time at home right now, try to follow these simple advices. And last, at the, at the end, in, in, the term, in the area of coding, I know that this is another part in Fab Academy, but just to mention it, there is a lot of protocols involved on reading digital sensors. Most of the sensors nowadays, when you're trying to do some more complex work are digital sensors. Digital sensors means those are devices that you talk like if they were another computer, another microcontroller, and you talk through a network, an I2C protocol, an SPI protocol, a serial or UART protocol, etc. Okay, so that means that you are not the one that does the work on the analog read and convert that reading to something. You just write some instruction based on some rules of a protocol and ask the other device, please give me the temperature and it will give you a number, okay? And you don't have to do anything else, but you have to learn how to talk to that device and how often can you talk to it and how to reset the device with an instruction, et cetera, et cetera. But that's more related to networks than to inputs and sensors. So that will be covered later. So I think that's, more or less everything from my part. There's a lot of information here, even if it seems a small documentation, check the links, try it, check the code. Uh, this uh, sensor list document has a lot of uh, funny information around sensors and complex sensors and stuff. Check always learn a spark phone and learn other fruit around those, the sensors they sell. They have a lot of, um, information, a lot of well-written libraries that you can use directly in Arduino. So don't reinvent the wheel, understand the concepts and then reuse the work of someone else. So I think that's it from my Boom. part. If anyone has any question. No, but thank you. Um, okay. So that's great. Uh,